Uh, yeah, hey everybody. As a reminder, I'm David. I work at Meta. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about um, a project that we've been working on for about a year and a half or so at Meta called SkyDXT. Um, I'll go over first what it is, uh, what the APIs look like, how do you use it. Um, then uh, we'll also talk about why, why we need it and, and what kind of benefits you've gotten uh, from it at Meta. Um, the kind of meat of the discussion is probably going to be the middle, common objections. Uh, most people that really dislike it or makes them very nervous usually say one of two or three things. So as a community, I think there will hopefully be some some things we can kind of align on as far as how to address some of these objections. And then uh, we'll talk about some interesting changes to BPF that we had to make if we have time. That's not, not really super necessary for the discussion, but there's a lot of good uh, material there too. So, all right. So yeah, what is Skedext? Uh, so it's a new scheduling class in the kernel, a new, uh, new scheduling policy in the kernel that lets you implement scheduling policies in BPF. Uh, so the, the kind of base abstraction for a scheduling policy directly in the kernel is a SCED class. Um, there's a whole bunch of callbacks you have to implement. Uh, they're extremely complicated. Um, you have to know the entire internal implementation of the actual core scheduler to implement this struct. So the abstractions are very, uh, very leaky. Um, so we implemented a new SCED class that uses a struct ops um, BPF program so that you can implement the policy in BPF. A much more um, straightforward, kind of self-contained interface, we hope. Um, yeah, so let's take a look. Uh, and well, let's, let's first start by why are we doing this. So um, there's a few reasons that we want to do this. Uh, hardware is getting pretty interesting, as, as we all know. Uh, AMD, as an example, uh, released a chip a few months ago that has two CCXs, two L3 caches on a single uh, socket. One of the two CCXs has a 3D V cache sitting on top of it, which means that one side, one of the two CCXs has good cache locality but poor thermal throttling because they can't dissipate the heat out of the 3D V cache. And the other one has worse cache locality but you can more aggressively um, power the, the, the cores so they can, they can run at a higher frequency. And this is an extremely difficult scheduling problem to get right. Um, it regresses lots of games on Steam by like 50% if they're highly parallel and CPU bound. Um, on Linux, on Windows, it performs better. Um, I don't know why, but maybe Dave can tell us. No, um, so we want to be able to experiment quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to experiment in the core scheduler itself. Like I said, you have to, under you have to understand the entire implementation, tens of thousands of like extremely complex uh, um, logic to, to be able to do that. Um, and you can crash the host. Uh, you know, there's all, all the normal drawbacks that come with running uh, core kernel code instead of BPF. So we want it to be able to iterate quickly. Um, we also want it to be able to implement bespoke schedulers. Uh, so schedulers that are targeted for specific applications, um, at least at first, and then maybe we can generalize it with the experimentation. Uh, but at Meta, uh, we were able to build a scheduler that gives us about one and a half to 3% increase in uh, throughput for our main web workload. And that figures including a custom patch that we have um, in CFS as well. But with, with just uh, SCED EXE, we got one and a half, three percent and about three to six percent P99 latency as well. And um, obviously at the scale of, a, of like a, a large company, that's, that's quite a lot of capacity savings. Um, so it's, it's, it's worked out quite well for us. Um, and then also you can do other things. You can, you can roll out new policies. So if we ever have another variant of L1TF, um, instead of waiting for you know, a year for uh, the, the mitigation to be implemented and designed and rolled out to the new kernel and then you have to roll it out to your fleet. You can implement something to mitigate it in, in SCED EXT and BPF. You roll it out um, and then you don't have to really disrupt your whole fleet to, to deal with it. And then of course, uh, moving some policy decisions and complexity into user space. Uh, one of the schedulers we wrote uh, has a load balancer written in Rust in user space with all the hot paths living in the kernel. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of flexibility with, with SCED EXT. But as we'll see, that last line makes a lot of people really nervous. So we'll have to figure out what to do about that. Okay, yeah, so, so this is the crux of what it is. Um, you implement a struct ops uh, struct. Uh, the callbacks are relatively self-explanatory. We tried to make it that way at least. For example, for select CPU, that's called when a task first, first wakes up and um, whatever CPU you return is the CPU where the task is migrated um, at wake up time. It doesn't have to be the last CPU that uh, it runs on. Um, but it's an optimization to, to try to decide where it should go. Uh, for example, we oftentimes in select CPU will just put the task into a global, global FIFO queue that we pull from when the core is going to go idle. And that lets us increase CPU utilization and get 
um, some good perf out of, out of uh, the scheduler. Um, there's in queue, of course, DQ. There's uh, st every state change when a task becomes runnable, when it's running, when it's stopping, et cetera. Um, you don't have to implement all of them. You can implement the actually the only thing you need to implement is the name of the scheduler. We have default behavior for all the other ones, um, but that's that's how you do it. That's how you implement a BPF scheduler. Um, so here's an example of a really simple one. Uh, this flag here, switch partial. Uh, you can set that obviously when you open the program before you load it, um, and that lets you tell BPF if you want to only switch some tasks to use SCEDIXT or if you want to switch all of them. Uh, we recommend switching all of them because uh, because SCEDIXT technically runs at a lower priority than CFS. If you have co-located CFS and SCEDIXT tasks on a CPU, it doesn't really work out well because CFS will will uh, will starve the CPU from SCEDIXT. So. Usually for a default scheduler, you kind of want one or the other, but you could partition the host or something like that, so it's an option for you. And if you want to switch them all, there's a kfunc here that you can call, which does it for you in, a, in the main kernel. Uh, more interestingly, on the enqueue path, uh, we can check some enqueue flags to see if we should uh, locally schedule the task, so keep it on the current CPU. There's another kfunc here called SCX BPF Dispatch, which I'll go into more details on in a later slide. You pass it the task, you pass it what we call a dispatch queue ID, um, and then you pass some, some enqueue flags as well. And um, I'll go again into more details about that. And then uh, there's this exit handler as well where you can print whatever you want. Why did you exit? Print some stats. Um, you know, yeah, it's BPF. <laughs> um, okay, so what are dispatch queues? So those are the main abstraction for, for bringing tasks out of the BPF scheduler and into the main kernel. Um, there's an impotence, obviously, between, um, between what you want to do in BPF and what the actual system can do. So every CPU has what we call a local dispatch queue, which is a FIFO queue, or a, uh, you can also make it like a weighted VTime queue if you want, but FIFO is, is a good mental model. Um, and so that's the queue that you put the task in if you want it to be scheduled on that CPU. So that's the FIFO that, you, that, uh, that the, the core scheduler pulls from in, in a pick next task, the callback in the SCED class. Um, but you can implement um, any number of dis, uh, dispatch queues that aren't the local ones. So, for example, you could have a FIFO per CCX, so per L3 cache. You could have one globally if it's like a single socket, single CCX, per C group. So you could do FIFO scheduling amongst the C group. And at various stages of the task scheduling lifecycle, you, you can schedule the task on a dispatch queue and then later consume it to actually um, pull it onto the local CPU. Or you can do what's called direct dispatch if you want to put it directly on the CPU. Now, it, it, it gets a little bit confusing because we have other data structures that you can use in BPF directly. Um, for example, uh, our B-trees, which, which Dave Marchevsky implemented for us, um, you can use that to implement your own weighted VTime tree directly in the BPF scheduler. That's not the same thing as, um, as the dispatch queues. The core kernel actually understands what dispatch queues are, and, they may, and we maintain them for you. We synchronize accessing them for you and everything. But if you have tasks uh, enqueued in BPF, like in an RB tree, that's, that's obviously only visible to BPF. And eventually, you would have to put that onto a dispatch queue to be able to, to run it on the CPU. So there's two main operations for, uh, for how you interact with a dispatch queue. There's the dispatch operation, SCX BPF dispatch. And there's consume, SCX BPF consume. Yeah, so hopefully I'm not being too repetitive here. But the idea is. When you want to put a task onto a FIFO that the core kernel understands, you dispatch it. You can also do direct dispatch, where you put a task directly on the local dispatch queue for the CPU. Or if you don't have any tasks on the local dispatch queue, you can consume a task from a dispatch queue, uh, and that pulls it off of the dispatch queue and puts it right onto your local dispatch queue for the CPU. So you can do dispatching, which is essentially enqueuing in the FIFO, or consuming, which is pulling it and actually uh, running it on your, on your CPU. Um, yeah, so here's a flowchart example. You know, we don't have to spend uh, 20 minutes uh, understanding all of it, but we'll, we can go through it a little bit quickly. So if a task is waking up, um, we would call the select CPU callback that I, that, uh, that I mentioned. We'll migrate you to that CPU. The task then becomes runnable, so we call the enqueue callback. In enqueue, you can dispatch the task, or you could enqueue it directly in the BPF scheduler. So if you did a direct dispatch, you said, I want to run this on my CPU right now, maybe because in select CPU, you detected that the CPU that you migrated it to is going to go idle. So you don't need to go through the whole enqueue path. You just schedule it directly and let it run, and, and uh, you, can, you can just do that way. Or if, if uh, you know, you're overcommitted, you actually have to share the CPU, 
You can enqueue it in um, in an RB tree. You can enqueue it in a global dispatch queue. That's not going to be that's not where it's going to run immediately. You can enqueue it in BPF. And then on the other side, which is which is a representation of the uh, the dispatch path or the balance path, as we call it in the scheduler, which essentially means you're going to go idle if you don't find another core. Excuse me, another task. Um, this is this is what we do on Skeddy XT. Uh, we check to see if you have any tasks to run, and if we do, then great, we we return. Otherwise, we call the dispatch callback, where you can either dispatch tasks to a dispatch queue or consume them. So, a little bit, yeah, it takes some getting used to to kind of understand the terminology, but we tried to make it you know, self-contained in terms of, in terms of uh, the life cycle for these tasks and how to, how to run them. Okay, so before we go on, obviously I'm sure there's like a million details that I either papered over or, uh, or didn't even talk about. So any questions from anybody? Um, just a small question. Can you write a scheduler that will bypass the affinities set by user? You, uh, you could. Uh, so, uh, so actually, no. So we check the, uh, the CPU's pointer in a task to see if you try to schedule it on that CPU. And the core kernel, ext.c, not, not scedcore.c, but we'll, we'll check to see that you're not doing something you're not actually allowed to do. And if you do something dumb, we'll, we'll kick the scheduler out and, and uh, go back to CFS. So for example, if you returned a CPU that was like, you know, negative 20 in select CPU, we'll see that that's bogus and we'll just kick the scheduler out. So there's some sanity checking um, in the core, the core scheduler. But what, what we did for the scheduler that I alluded to for, for Meta for the, the web workload is we had soft affinities. So you have a C group. Um, we would give some cores to the C group, like let's say, you know, 16 cores in the system. We would give that C group priority to run on that subset of the system, but if you know they didn't need all of them, we could pull some other tasks from from other other C groups and just try to keep CPU util, util, excuse me utilization high. So that's the problem with with like hard affinities, right? Is you you were going to underutilize the host. That's the downside. But something like Skeddy XT gives you a little more flexibility to kind of kind of color uh, gray the lines out between between something like a hard affinity and and uh, just having the whole host be uh, be open. So to make sure I understand, like you'll you you'll fail on like a bogus CPU, but like you will not check that it respects like the whatever user has said with sched CPU affinity or something. Yeah. So so if, if you if you make a mistake in the scheduler, we will check that in the core kernel, and we'll make sure that you can't do anything that would corrupt the host or crash the host or like do an incorrect operation. So. That includes, for example, if you if a task became runnable and it just sat there for like 30 seconds doing nothing, that's indic indicative of like a hung task that shouldn't happen in, in a correct system. So we'll kick the scheduler the scheduler out there and go back to CFS. But you could, um, yeah, you can kind of you can kind of as long as there's you know affinities you can't violate. But again, you could kind of create new new abstractions for like how do you provide resources in a looser manner. Yeah. Before? Yeah. <coughs> when you and see the schedule to the other, uh, from one implementation to the other one. So maybe you have uh, some task have, uh, in your internal queue, but uh, you have a translator to the other one. Is there any way you hand over the, the task in your queue to the other yeah. new task? So, you, so you're, are you asking if you already locally dispatched it, can you move it to another dispatch queue? Or no, no, I mean, uh, is that uh, in uh, your, <coughs> finally you have a, uh, implement a scheduler, mm -hmm. but uh, you have the other scheduler have a transit from this one to the other one. But uh, you have uh, some task have a, uh, in your local queue. It's not the dispatch to, to the CPU oh. queue. So are you asking essentially how do we like prevent races where you have a, a task that we've enqueued but now it's in CFS and you don't want to incorrectly dispatch it if it's not no longer running in Skeddy XT? Or are you asking how do you like if you have a task that's enqueued in CPU A? Can you can you uh, balance it and dispatch it to a remote CPU? No, I mean uh, for example, you have an arbitrary to okay. keep the task locally, not a dispatch to the CPU's queue mm -hmm. yet. So at some point, you will dispatch that task to the CPU, right? Right. Yep. But at this point, you transit to the other new scheduler. You, you, so you, you realize after you've dispatched it to the local CPU that you should have dispatched it to a different one to like increase utilization. Is that what you're saying? No, I mean the transit from one scheduler to the other scheduler. 
Right. So okay, wasn't yeah. yeah. So so you're worried about like running a task that should have been on CFS because you changed the SCED class. How do we prevent yeah, those yeah, races? Yeah. Okay. So the answer is you can. We'll, we'll check to see if it's still in CFS or excuse me in SCED X by the time we dispatch it. But when you do when you when you change SCED classes, you have to do a DQ um, to deactivate the task and then you re enqueue it in the new scheduler. So um, it's it's like a it's a it's a pretty slow like well synchronized operation in the in the core scheduler to do that as well. So the, the the scheduler will get the DQ callback when it's deactivated. It'll get pulled out of the. Uh, there, there's another callback I didn't show where you uh, you can disable a task in the scheduler as well. So you get a callback when it's leaving, um, and then uh, you know it would be gone, and, and uh, we would we would just verify that you didn't try to dispatch like a bogus task um, on the uh, on the the exe side. So another implication here is you can actually have spurious dispatches. So you could try to dispatch a task to multiple CPUs. And uh, we'll just detect that in exe.c and, and do uh, the one thing that we actually were able to do uh, to try to simplify things for the schedulers. So um, the answer is, yeah, it's fine. We'll, we'll detect it. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's synchronized with that deactivate, activate workflow. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we can move on to the, the juicy stuff. So yeah, uh, there's a common set of objections that I hear from people, like I said. Um, most people that I've spoken to, like almost everybody, except for maybe like literally two to four people, um, think that it's useful. Uh, they, they see the utility of, um, of being able to have a pluggable scheduler system, a, a scheduler system that you can easily experiment with so that you can then implement features in CFS and upstream them to like the, the, the main general scheduler. Um, so the objections typically aren't about design or functionality, though if you have thoughts, obviously we'd love to hear them and we'll incorporate them. Um, but they're, they're more about the sort of soft implications of something like Sked EXT. Um, I don't agree with many of them, but they're, they're rooted in a larger question about BPF in the ecosystem. So I think uh, they're, they're important to talk about now. And I think they're especially relevant now that you know, we're moving to the sort of newer model of BPF where we're not using UAPI and uh, things are really defined in the core kernel and they're implementing kind of core kernel uh, functionality like Sked EXT. So, the first one is that it's going to kill CFS contributions, and then more generally that it's going to kill any upstream contributions to the scheduler um, or whatever subsystem we have the struct ops implementation in. So yeah, you know they're going to they're folks not to <laughs> misquote anybody, but they're saying the schedulers are going to stay out of tree. As soon as you have this ability to load a BPF program that doesn't taint the kernel, vendors are going to ship their own schedulers. Um, people aren't going to contribute anymore, and you're going to have non-GPL schedulers. That part is just wrong because we we'll actually check that in the verifier, but. These are the kinds of things that people say. Um, I'm sure there's some truth to what they're saying, but we as a community, I think need to come up with like a general philosophy, I would say, towards these questions. Um, you know, for example, and I talk about this in another slide too, but we, for modules, there's a very clear incentive to upstream them, right? Like if you break something in an upstream module, that's a bug. If you break something in an out of tree module, nobody cares, nobody's gonna give you support, anything like that. With BPF, it's it's sort of a middle ground, right? Like you can you can load a BPF program that's not in tree, and it, the only time that you would fix something is if like you crashed the kernel or the verifier was wrong. Um, but but that's the point is like you would you would fix it. It didn't taint the kernel. Um, so for SCEDX, we can tell people things like okay, if you if you upstream a scheduler and struct ops change, we won't we won't let your scheduler break. We'll change your scheduler to use the new the new callbacks, and we'll prevent build breakages or even performance regressions. Um, but we don't really have, like, that hasn't been formalized in the community yet, right? Like, I don't think, I wouldn't say that we have a very clear, like, philosophy or policy for upstreamed BPF programs. So I know that we have upstreamed some, but does, do folks have, like, any thoughts about what it really means to upstream BPF and, like, how, how will that be consumed and, like, you know what? What's generally like? Can we come up with? A, can we come up with a, a policy that's like modules? That's like clear, crystal clear. I'm probably commenting on something else, but just a question that popped up in my hand. Mm -hmm. So this looks like kind of all on or nothing, right? You're either using this get ext class, or you you're using CFS. I guess there might be maybe some middle ground where like for the task you say, okay, I'm overriding some of the CFS policies, but then the rest is, for example, your case with AMD, like I know I no. maybe I need to prefer course one, two, three, four, 
for the rest, let the CFS play with, with it. You, you can't do that because CF, CFS is, is like a weighted fair V time scheduler, right? So if you implement certain callbacks in Sketty XT, like you're deciding where to migrate it, it doesn't really fit in with like the math of the scheduler at a higher level. And it's, it's just, you can't, like this <laughs> complexity is so insane in the core scheduler. Like things that happen in a callback that are like supposedly supposed to be for migration are actually like core math for the, the, whole, the whole algorithm. So it's, it's an interesting idea, but I think, I think we have to think about partitioning the system for, for schedulers per core, not per, per task. You know, because per I know, for example, Android, right? They, they are notoriously known for like vendors doing some custom CFS performance um, right, value right. add hacks, which I don't know. Like, well, so that's, that's, that's exactly right. And so we, like w when I was in Italy uh, at OSPM a few weeks ago, I, there were a few people that I basically said, okay, well, what do you think is gonna happen if like, who would stop contributing to CFS if we did this? And the people that I spoke to couldn't think of anybody because it's a pretty small community. But more importantly, the situation couldn't really get any worse is how I see it, right? Like, you have you have Android, which has lots of vendor hooks, you know, because they had to for performance reasons. You have um, Steam Deck and like uh, and you know uh, Valve, who have all these. The Linux gaming community has so many out of tree patches, and that's fine. You know, we can tell people that, but we have to. I think in order to answer this question like confidently, we have to come up with a policy that like that formalizes incentivizing people to upstream BPF programs, right? Because the difference, like, I mean, for, for XDP programs and stuff like that, there might be some sometimes where like, you want to upstream it, you want to open source it. Obviously, there's Cilium and lots of things like that. But for upstreaming into the kernel tree and treating these programs more like modules than, like, than sort of standalone BPF programs that do a specific, like, implement a trigger or something like that, we have to figure out what does it mean to have a BPF module, you know? It's, is it different than XDP? Is it is it the same? Is it is it the same as module or is it midway between? You know, it's that's I guess, the thing. I guess yeah. from my point of view, from whatever BPF programs we do at Google, right? Like, there's really nothing to upstream. It's some custom business logic no one cares about. I would assume like the the scheduler you have as well, right? Oh, if is this my magic uh, no. process? Treat it really carefully. Put it here and there, like, and the rest is. So, so there are schedulers you can upstream. So, so th yeah, I probably should take that line off because it's it's literally like bespoke. But for example, um, one of the example schedulers we implemented um, is a tickless scheduler. So if you have a VM, you have a bunch of VMs running or a bunch of vCPUs running um, on a host, you could have a scheduler where all decisions are made from a single CPU and um, you send a reset IPI when you want to trigger a reset on that core. And so that avoids VM exits because of timer interrupts. You know, like you can, you can do things that in CFS don't make any sense at all. And, you know, so in, 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 in other words, you could, you could imagine like a VM, like a heavily optimized VM scheduler that you would upstream that it really is generalizable. Or like even the bespoke scheduler would probably be appropriately generalized as like a scheduler that maps CPUs loosely to C groups, right? Um, you know, in the one that I wrote, I'm literally checking like the task name and doing something if it's an HHVM thread, but but that's because we're we're experimenting. But eventually we wouldn't we wouldn't do that, you know. Yeah, but I mean the, to play the devil's advocate, I guess for the scheduler folks. If you're upstreaming BPF scheduler, why don't you just like write a it in C and call it another scheduler plus and, and Well, that you can't do, yes. <laughs> so that's that's another story. So when you when you add a feature to the scheduler, you cannot add, like like ARM is running in CFS, right? They're not, there wasn't like a power aware scheduler and and a server scheduler. Um, so our argument is, okay, fine, that's, that's great, but you need somewhere to experiment with it. Look. <laughs> You're right. I mean, there, there's uh, th that that could happen, but yeah, I, I, there's probably no answer. But I'm just yeah, it's hypothetical. Like yeah, if, yeah. If, if once so, you're done with the experiments, like, what do you do? Uh, so uh, about uh, where to put the scheduler, have you looked at the preload BPF program? Yeah, yeah. So you think that's a good candidate or is no for some Potentially, reason? yeah. I mean, like something where you have like a skeleton essentially that you, you check in. But we have to, but it, it's, it's a little different, right? Because this is about upstream ability. This is about like the guarantees that you get without any UAPI or, or anything like that. So in terms of where to put it, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Um, we could put it there. Uh, but we need to figure that part out, like the sort of mechanical part, and I think we need to figure out like the policy. Just like for KFUNCS, we decided there's no strict ABI stability. Um, that's, I think, the part that there's, that at least in my opinion is, is 
like like if you were if you were a scheduler person, you don't care if we put the scheduler. We can put it in like kernel sched. We can put it in preload. We can put it in BPF. Like that part, I think they're not as concerned about. Um, I think it's like like they don't believe that anybody will ever put anything anywhere. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, for the like uh, like logistic part, I think like once you get in there, like uh, there's a way to test the whether this thing build right. If like uh, you, you you change your key funk, there's a way to know whether this one is broken or not. So, so uh, right, okay. So so you you think that we should basically go the build? It sounds like you're 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 arguing for the guarantee being similar to a module, where like you cannot regress the scheduler. If it's you upstream, cannot uh, regress yeah. the, the build, or like if you put something there, of course this has has to be something meaningful. It's not a, like a random shit you just put there. Well, just make sure no one remove. Well, maybe that's a way to make sure no one remove your k-funk. Well, <laughs> I don't I know mean, whether no, we right? want like that, we, but like that's probably one way to do it. <laughs> you well, I mean, there's going to be like a bar for upstreaming your schedulers too. Like yeah. I, I consider it similar to a file system. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there might be somebody who's like, I really don't want this k-funk to go away. But if they have a scheduler where they need the k-funk, that's actually quite like, okay, they upstreamed it. You know, there's there's a legitimate use case that that they did. So yeah, and I want to add like the value is like uh, maybe uh, for whoever you're sharing their scheduler, maybe they don't see the value. But uh, like uh, I would say, like for many people who reading the patch, there's definitely value. For example, I have very little background in the scheduler. I want to look at, hey, why people look at this scheduler? Why they're making this decision? Why Google uses this and Meta use something different? It's just yeah. good learning experience for, for everyone. So I, I see like uh, from the community point of view, there's definitely uh, like a value, like sharing pe what people are using. Yeah, I mean, it's open source. <laughs> Yeah. So I think another thing, Daniel, did you want to say something? Or you, okay. So uh, the the uh, so that's one argument is the build breakage, and that's what I've that's what I've been telling people. So I'm glad that you, that you agree, Song. <laughs> but uh, there there are people that say fine, but um, it doesn't matter because you're going to have well. So let's move on to the next one. Um, okay, let's talk about this one first. Okay, so. People are like, fine, you know, uh, we can upstream some schedulers. Let's say the, the, schedu the CFS thing won't be a problem. But um, now distros are going to have to support vendor schedulers. And, you know, everybody who writes an out of tree VPF scheduler, now we have to support that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a nightmare. Like, what if this vendor's uh, performance regresses or whatever? Um, so this is, Yuri brought this point up. Yuri Lely, who's, who's a, uh, works at Red Hat and he's a scheduler maintainer. Um, and so obviously this isn't the first time that a that a that a distro has to you know has to worry about BPF or it would be would rather would be this would this isn't a new situation for distros like RHEL markets itself is an excellent distro for for XDP so there's there's actually benefits to for to BPF for for distros but do we you know like given that this is a very core piece of the kernel this is the scheduler like do we need to come up with kind of our own philosophy around like the kind of larger the, the 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 responsibility of the larger ecosystem or like our expectations for for what the kernel community would have to support right like like if you load a if you load a bpf scheduler where you don't schedule any any like io threads and you have io timeout like is that not a like people basically people are saying that we need to we need to taint out of tree schedulers and um, to protect distros, to protect developers. Daniel and I spoke about this earlier, and you made a, a very valid point, which is that it's probably going to discourage a lot of people from using the, uh, the scheduler. Yeah, I mean, like, I, like, I think uh, rel customers or others, like, if this would taint the kernel, then they are basically. Uh, I mean, back then when I work at Red Hat, it is the first thing where you look, and then you say, "Well, I don't support you because your kernel is tainted." Yeah. I think maybe um, the way. It like how the question could be asked from like a distro support side like do you run into this problem with the upstream cfs scheduler as well or is this just really specific to the scheduler program that you run so but i i mean i would be against tainting because that would i yeah i am too i am too but it's it's hard to art so like a lot of this is just me finding myself in difficult conversations and I'm trying to kind of like brainstorm with everybody. It's hard to argue with somebody that says something like, oh, this is extremely core relative to something like XDP. And for something this core, it's like, 
it really deserves to taint. And if you need your scheduler to not taint the kernel, you would upstream it, you know. Um, but I, I, I do agree with you, Daniel. I think it would, it would, you know, the, the whole point of this is you can use BPF. So that would suck if, if we had to taint it. So to add a little bit to it, so <clears throat> we can actually distinguish different taints. So one thing is, I think what Daniel is worried about is tainting like everything, everything, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense, like take it to extreme. It doesn't make sense to taint for like classic BPF. Mm -hmm. TCP dump, somebody says TCP dump and there is a taint, right? So the BPF is loaded, but does it make sense? Not really, right? Mm -hmm. But at the extreme case, uh, for example, thinking about uh, out of three kernel modules that mm -hmm. exposing k funks, and this k funk potentially doing some like garbage, so VPF called it, and that module like did something in the end that like caused like VPF to like misbehave. Mm -hmm. Right, also potentially possible. So should we somehow flag the situation? So it's not like scheduler or anything related, but since k funks can be in modules, it. I potentially see some sort of not necessarily taint flag, but I would call it a trait flag mm -hmm. or something that uh, people has a way to debug that like kernel module. Will. Like this example, the one uh, Kubernetes were loading special kernel modules with WebAssembly running and calling VPF from it. What this WebAssembly was doing, no idea, right? But then, like, imagine Sysbot report saying, like, yeah, BPF is crushing because of that. But but that makes sense. But in the example you gave, if you loaded an out-of-tree module, it doesn't matter that if there were k-funks or not, right? Like, that would actually taint the whole kernel. So you so I, so I think, are you saying that because... Like, like when I think of just the core SCAD EXT, it's a, like, you could mess up the system, but eventually we'll kick you out, we'll recover, and, like, we should go back to CFS, and it's a bug if we don't recover correctly. But I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, I, I agree with you, and I think it would be a lot easier to get it upstreamed if we had some kind of middle ground between, like, a hard taint and a FYI, there's a new scheduler that isn't upstreamed, that's an, even a temporary state or something like that, but it's, yeah, that's, that's the other consideration. And maybe the other thing that would be useful in this context, like when you somehow crash or like like when you get a splat, right, that you print that a BPF scheduler was loaded and you, mm -hmm. the users get the information about it mm -hmm. instead yeah, of yeah. retained, maybe. That's, that's a good idea to do regardless. Yeah. I, I was just going to add, like, the, the first, one of the first things we do when we get bugs now is like we just run BPF tool and say like give us a list of all the programs, give us a list of all the maps so that we know how everything is attached and running. Mm -hmm. So I mean I'm not sure why the distros can't just adopt the same stance. It's like if you're going to file a bug then they have their bug tool stuff run on crash, they have their crash dump thing run. Can't they just collect all the BPF tool programs which will be very explicitly say schedule thing is attached, here's the program type, here's the ID, here's the cookie or whatever you want, however you well, want to identify the different ones and, they, they and just go, like, they'll know, right? Like, it's not, shouldn't be so difficult to know that this stuff is attached. That's so I don't think... Point. What I've noticed, crash, or crash already collects it. Like, you have a fingerprint of all the BPF programs and maps. The, the problem is that they, knowing that there was a scheduler isn't their, isn't their worry, right? It's that they would have to, they would have to debug a, a system that crashed with a scheduler that was like some out of tree thing that they, that they didn't know about. Even the system shouldn't have crashed, but people are worried that they will have to support, like, like I think people are are not convinced that we can do a very core scheduler safely in BPF, even though they're not right, and we can. I mean, I guess my my point is they they can, they'll get the crash dump. It'll tell them there was a scheduler that was attached. They'll look at the crash dump, and if then they'll need to make a decision whether or not yeah. they say like, "Hey, we're not going to support you because you ran this," or or they will, right? Like, I'm, I'm yeah, not sure if they need contract. anything more than what they have, right? Like, yeah. Why do so they? Yeah. I mean, I agree. Yeah. Like. So we. So do you think? I, I agree with 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 you. I agree with Daniel. I agree with Alexa. I think. Maybe in the short term, we just are very, very explicit about what scheduler was loaded. We tell you exactly when it was loaded, whatever, 
And, um, you know, if it becomes a problem, we can tell distros, like, look, it's, it should be very clear. Like, if you have a task that was never run and it was a exe scheduler, like, maybe there's an issue, maybe not. But hopefully giving our policy could be we'll give you all the information about it, but we officially don't think that this is a kernel bug. If, if we did crash the kernel, it's a BPF bug and we'll fix it. But otherwise, you know, you should be able, you should be able to load a BPF program, a BPF scheduler, um, and it doesn't taint anything if it's, if it's out of tree. I mean, that would be, I mean, I'm not on the distro side, never have been, but that would be my, my take. It'd be like, well, you're going to get a crash dump. Mm -hmm. It's either going to be somewhere completely outside of scheduling that has nothing to do with scheduling, and you'll be like, I don't really care if there was the thing attached or not. Or you're going to look at it, and it'll say like, hey, look, there's a backtrace through the scheduler, or it's like uh, something yeah. didn't get scheduled. And That's you'll be like, true. Run it again without your scheduler, or take a hike. Yeah. I'm not going to fix your scheduler for you. That's true. The only thing you could you could cause a crash somewhere else, even if it wasn't in the scheduler code, right? If you like, if you deadlock or something like that. But but yeah, that's I, I agree. Yeah. And also, we have, I think we've heard this argument also before in the case of networking with XTP, right? And it just so hasn't far, been a problem in practice. Like, yeah. That it's a support nightmare and so on. And I don't know, like, I would love to hear now, like, after so many years, like, what's the take? I mean, it seems to be okay. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, and distros advertise their, their ecosystem for adding, like, yeah, now EPFX. it's a feature for them. People yeah. pay money. Yeah. So I think yeah the the takeaway is we uh we just stand behind it and we we keep our we kind of stand our ground on on the policy. Cool. Yeah, and, and 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 the other thing is so maybe it's more like related once you upgrade your distro um then maybe you run into some performance regressions but given you have loaded your own custom BPF scheduler mm -hmm. it's just in you to figure out what's going on and in that case yeah. right. So that right and so that goes back to the first bullet point. So I think that if you're an out-of-tree scheduler, you get no guarantees other than that you shouldn't crash the kernel, right? You're just a BPF program. Yeah. And no build breakage regressions, it's your fault. Performance regressions, it's on you. And then if it's if it's upstream, you get both performance and build build protection. Yeah. And that's also like in the case of networking, the same stance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So this is the last one, this which is always a really fun discussion. So um so Everybody, this is like, I have had an extremely difficult time discussing this with people, and here's why. So the people's rationale is they're worried that BPF is going to force UAPI into the scheduler. Now, the, the first thing that I say to people when they say this is don't worry. I know that a lot of BPF is in UAPI headers. Like, if you're doing, you know, if, if you're, you could, you, could, you could have UAPI issues if you use the wrong type of BPF program. But um, for struct ops, it's not UAPI at all. You can chain struct ops. It's only exposed in internal kernel headers, and we don't have to worry about it at all. Um, and Linus had talked about this a little bit at, uh, at the, the Kernel Maintainer Summit. Stephen uh, yesterday pointed out that it was actually directed at him. Um, but the general, the general you know, perspective of folks, if I had to paraphrase here, I had to represent what they say, is that they're worried that today BPF's not a UAPI issue because Linus hasn't seen a problem, but eventually it could be. Um, and they're basically not willing to accept anything else. And so, like, I don't really know, like, like is there anything that we can do as a community to, like, make an outward strong stance that could potentially put their minds at ease? Like, could we say that we'll never, that we'll never, you know, uh, violate UAPI and like, I mean, we can't tell Linus to do anything, but if we had this as like an official policy, do folks think that would help? This is really, I guess, directed more to people that have, have more upstream experience and maybe more of a relationship with Linus, but if this has ever been an issue for anybody else that's trying to add a BPF feature, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I think you guys know what I'm getting at, right? Like, how do we, how do we really drive home and be clear about the expectations um, about this? Very open-handed, wavy question. Oh, whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean. And to give you to give another example, so I, I explained this to somebody, and they came back and they said, "Well, because because you you, ed, you so BPF is a kernel to kernel program. The kernel's calling out to a kernel program. They're in CPL zero for x86. Pretty pretty crystal clear. But then in the kernel side in BPF, you have you know a map that's shared with user space like." You could imagine a protocol where 
you uh, in, in BPF program, you publish some messages to user space, which is essentially a protocol to inform a user space scheduler where everything is in user space, which is like Ghost, of how to implement a scheduler. And so, you know, the, uh, the, the, the kernel part, yeah, you know, it's no, no, no UAPI there, but in practical terms, if you ever did regress something and some big out of tree, um, you know, user space scheduler, or even if it's upstream, I don't know, but this big user space scheduler regresses, well, now it's a problem and okay, don't, you, 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 have, to re you have to revert. Like, have we ever kind of like really thought through the implications of how to prevent that sort of scenario? And like, you know, if that makes, yeah. Hopefully that is somewhat clear as far as an ask. The answer might be that we just stand by what we think is going to be the case. Like, we just say, look, there's no UAPI guarantees at all. It's it's un it's unstable. We document it just like we did for KFUNCS, and we just you know, I guess we can't force people to believe something. So maybe the maybe the move is for us to just document it and and hope for the best. With document it with good intentions and hope that's how it how it turns out. I think that's probably the minimum we should do. <laughs> Yeah, but so if, if there's anything above that, yeah, that's what I would love to hear about because it feels like a very difficult, you know, thing to to sort of like logically approach. Yeah, it's something to think about. We can, we can take it offline. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll be done by five. I just want to go through a few a uh, few other slides. Um, just some changes that we had to add to, to uh, BPF to support all this stuff. So one of them um, is a new K pointer called a CPU mask, BPF CPU mask. Um, it's a wrapper around the, the internal kernel CPU mask T. Um, you can create them, treat them like normal K pointers, store them in maps. Uh, you, can, uh, you can interact with them like normal, normal uh, CPU masks. Uh, one of the nice features that we added is you can actually compare a BPF CPU mask directly to a CPU mask T. Um, we have uh, we we act, we figure out that they're type uh, type identical according to the C standard, and so you can compare, um, you know, like a read-only internal kernel CPU mask with a BPF one, which is kind of nice, and we use that um, in some of our schedulers that we that we added in the the uh, the, the patches we sent upstream. Um, this one is pretty interesting. So the we talked about this actually during Alexia's pre presentation about one of the big changes that we had, but originally with K pointers, and just as a refresher to people that aren't aware, K pointers are um, a type of object in BPF programs where you can safely store an internal kernel object in a BPF map um, and know that it'll get reaped when the, when the map goes away. You can, you can essentially store internal kernel objects um, safely. And so originally, to get, uh, to get a new uh, ref count on a, uh, an object that was in a map, you had to call this K pointer, you had to use this K pointer get API, which assumed that, which, which verified that you were passing it a map value and um, you had to have you know internal synchronization where you like would would go under an RCU lock and and do all these kinds of things, um, and so now we we realize that generally what, what almost every object in the kernel actually cares about is is it RCU safe or not, and so we instead updated the verifier to um, to leverage RCU safety to know if you can actually um, trust a, a K pointer so that you can pass it to to a K funks and stuff like that safely. So. On the left here, you use k-pointer get. It does an atomic acquire when successful. And then you can call this BPFC group ancestor uh, k-funk. But on the right side, you can do you go into an RCU read region. You read the map value. If it's present, then you can use it like any other um, C group pointer, because you know it'll be valid by the time the, uh, the read region ends. Um, so yeah, pretty nifty. Um, one implication here is that for the k-pointer get, you could synchronize whatever you wanted to in the k-funk. So if you had a spin lock, if you had whatever, it's just an implementation detail of the k-funk. Now that we have this notion of, you know, like the BPF program itself containing the synchronization, uh, if we ever wanted to add a new method for, for synchronizing k-pointers, we would have to implement that in BPF. Um, but, you know, practically speaking, I don't think that's very likely. Uh, at least it hasn't been a problem yet, but something to keep in mind for the future. Um, yeah, so another Citation so uh, wrote a scheduler that, uh, that uh, recursively walks uh, C groups um, and flattens the hierarchy so that you, have, um, you don't have to do a recursive walk to implement the CPU controller for deciding uh, which, which uh, C group you should pull a task from and how long it should run. Um, the, the CPU controller, we, we don't use it at Meta because it's, it's too slow for us, but 
using this approach, um, which, which is part of the upstream patches, and using Dave's um, RB tree map type, we were able to implement you know, a version of, of CPU control that's slightly less precise than recursive walking um, every time you do load balancing, um, but, but is good enough for us and gives us pretty good performance. Um, so that's another kind of nifty thing. Um, local key pointer stashing. I'm just reading the thing. Yeah, okay, and then Dave had also talked about the BPF Objinu APIs. Um, so yeah, you can store those in maps. Um, do also, it's, it's very flexible framework now for, for, uh, for writing code that really looks like kernel code. Um, yep, yeah, and this is another one using the RB tree APIs. And that's it. We did a lot of other stuff, but that's probably enough for now. <laughs> I had a question. So, in, in terms of the earlier point that you made for upstreaming schedulers, right? So that would be like for generic ones that would apply in many cases that are useful to many people, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think yes. it should be a dumping ground. I think it should be held to a pretty high bar. Um, I mean, the idea is there, there's a couple of ways that that those that we could go in that direction. And I think no matter what, it should be high quality. But we could either have these schedulers be like general for like a, a large class of workloads. Like this is a paravert scheduler and this is a, um, you know, this is a, I don't know, like a gaming scheduler where it's like frame rates are, are what's what's optimized for. Or even more generally, like a soft real-time scheduler might be more appropriate for, for games. So I think we can go that direction where we implement, we make this, the Linux, um, you know, scheduler ecosystem kind of more like file systems where you choose which one you want and you don't generally, like you're, there's no expectation that we're going to always kind of go into one file system, um, but the, or we could do the second thing, which is uh, we add these upstream schedulers. People use them. They see if they like them. They see if they work. And uh, eventually, if they're like proven to really work well, and we get the APIs right and the features right, we we upstream that into CFS, and then we remove the scheduler when you can just use CFS. Um, so I th I actually think that. Personally, um, the, the hardware is getting so complex and like the needs for performance are so aggressively, like, like we're trying to eke every single instruction we can out of the, the CPU that the former of the two is more likely to be like a clean ecosystem that's extensible and is, you know, is really kind of self-describing. Um, but the realities of the scheduler, uh, you know, like the scheduler community, which I understand very much where they're coming from, is it might be, it, I think they would be more open to the idea if, if it's supposed to be kind of a funnel, you know, into, into CFS. So how complete this overall, I guess, architecture? Can I implement CFS, for example, on it? You can, yes. I mean, so, so, okay, so CFS is, like, enormous, obviously. There's, like, a million heuristics. You can implement a weighted VTime fair scheduler um, pretty easily, actually, and you can add a lot of heuristics and stuff as well. Um, it's stable enough that we're rolling it out to prod at Meta, um, and we think it's feature complete for data centers, but uh, we thought that when we went to LPC last year, and then Josh Dunn and other people from Google pointed out a lot of like huge feature gaps that we implemented that were super useful, like the tickless scheduling as an example. So it's, 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 um, it's definitely uh, featureful and, and stable enough for you to implement it's like a normal scheduler, right, like a VTime scheduler, like like a EVDF, which is the new SCED class that Peter proposed recently. Um, but if there's anything you know that we, we haven't added that would be useful, we could do that too. Yeah. I, I was sort of wondering about your, your example earlier about um, uh, like you have a scheduler where part of it's being done in user space and you've got like, kind of like the, like the shape like, of the maps or whatever the coordination mechanisms are, right? Just to be clear, sorry, do you mean the one where you did the load balancing in user space or the whole thing is in user space and you're publishing like... A so I'm model? thinking about this from the kind of UI, UAPI okay. concern so kind of angle. One. Yeah, sure. Um, and like would it make sense to say like the line is either you're shoving the entire user space program plus the, you know, uh, the, the, the BPF program in the kernel or you like not, none of that goes into the kernel? Because as soon as you split the user space side, it kind mm -hmm. of says, well, the distribution is separate. Uh, now you kind of have this some sort of a contract that says at least this version of the of the you know BPF program requires this sort of interaction with users. Yeah, right? that's a, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I, I think it like everything else aside, UAPI aside, it would be a good idea to upstream the uh, the user space part of that too, right? Um, 
my worry is that you know this is still kernel space and user space, right? So somebody could el somebody could implement a different user space scheduling framework on top of the the kernel BPF program because the kernel layer is basically a messaging layer at that point, right? Like it's 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 propagating synchronous scheduling events into a, an asynchronous like ring buffer or something like that, and then there's a messaging layer where you you map that to callbacks in user space, and you could do that in multiple ways. I think the the thing that like the the real crux of the issue with that is. Is there like a line in the sand for BPF programs where like practically speaking it is you, like it's basically just a little conduit between the kernel and, and, and user space, right? Like it's not a syscall and I don't like, I don't see really, if you're looking at it purely, any difference between a module that has, you know, some, some interaction with user space as well. But, you know, like, right, to your point, right, like, if we upstreamed that user space program, absolutely, but you could easily see somebody else coming out of tree and saying like, well look, you know, like this is a small thing and I have this big scheduling ecosystem that people use and, and that's kind of the, the worry. Yeah. I guess one of my thoughts is like, uh, the clearer that description of what it is and if it's, you know, there is not like, don't upstream something with, with user space interaction or it's like, it must be and will only work with the mm -hmm. one that is upstream, then yes. those are at least like simpler rules to sort of reason about and say, this is what you can expect mm -hmm. rather than sort of like, oh, well, you know, it's here and you know, it's code and do whatever you want. Yeah, uh, so I, that's a really good point. My, my two cents would be that the more like conservative we can be in terms of like what we consider valid so you have to upstream the user space portion, you have to upstream BPF. There's a coupling there um, that, is, that is entirely, yeah, they're, they're entirely coupled. I, th I imagine that would, be, um, that would be in our best interest and it's gonna give us the, the fewest surprises. And again, that, that, this is why this is like a departure from the traditional approach to BPF, right? Like these are, these are essentially supposed to be replacements for modules. And so I think we have to, um, we have to do whatever we can to try to minimize the risk of UAPI becoming an issue. And I, I personally would say, you know, we all like to upstream, so for the people in this room, it probably doesn't really matter anyways, right? You, um, we should be aggressive about saying like anything we can to minimize the risk of UAPI and minimize the risk of people accusing us of, of, of putting them at risk, yeah. So yeah, does, does anybody like horribly disagree with requiring a user space program using a BPF scheduler to be upstream to be considered like protected? I just have a comment to back to the question of, uh, of CFS. I think a CFS is actually a, a very rich set of uh, features mm -hmm. and uh, each of them are not very trivial to implement. I don't know, I don't know how complete the scheduler, scheduler ESD schedulers implemented in Meta. But I can I can think of uh, many features in CFS that it's really really non-trivial to implement. Can you, you think, think of this? Oh, sorry, go you're ahead. You're speaking of a uh, load balance. Load balancing include uh, uh, this uh, periodic load balancing, include idle balancing, include uh, this uh, no herds balancing. All of this. And so we do have all of those implemented. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Continue with that. So all. if you have all these implemented. Uh, the, the next question is that, do you plan to provide this as some building block to others to build uh, schedulers? Uh, so that's, I think, that's a really good question. I think, yes, we absolutely should. Um, there's a larger question to answer there first in BPF, which is like, how do you implement like BPF libraries essentially? And right now you can implement some, th some stuff in a header, um, but uh, it, maybe that's what we do for the short term. But I think, sure, you know, if people, like I, I imagine there's gonna be a class of schedulers that like is a, like they wanna do, so shared wait queue is the feature that I was, I was alluding to where you have this, that's the feature that we have internally that we're trying to up, that we're gonna upstream soon where you have this global FIFO when a, when a task is waking up and then when you go, when you go idle, it basically instead of new idle balance, you pull a task off of that, that queue. So maybe, maybe that's like something we could give to schedulers and they could build with their own machinery around that as an example. Um, <clears throat> But you know the the goal is to be able to do anything CFS does in BPF. And right now, I don't I'm, I don't feel comfortable saying we can do anything because we definitely can't do power management and like frequency scaling. And um, there's probably stuff that's not that's like server related that we can't do as well. And for a lot of the stuff we can do, it's pretty ugly. Like so so for the load balancing, um, Tajan wrote that the first the first version of that was like nested BPF calls and like. Like oh man, like the, the 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 heroics that we had to do to like not get the verifier to yell at us for like some random thing. I mean, it was it was really really ugly. So 
it's there, there's an argument to be made uh, in favor of CFS from that perspective as well. But I think it's a good goal to be able to say, you know, like if we're, if we're trying to go towards usability and we're also trying to go towards, you know, feature richness, um, I think that there is, we have the capacity to, to, to provide an ecosystem to the BPF schedulers that, that should make it much easier, not only to implement like a simple policy, but to implement a complex policy as well. Or like, you forget to drop a ref count on like 30 branches, you know, some error path somewhere, like BPF will catch that for you or, or that kind of thing. So to end the rambling, um, we can do a lot. Like we, everything you mentioned, we, could, we, could, we, we can do and we have in our example schedulers that we, that we sent upstream. Um, and if there's anything we missed, any features that you would need or that you think um, are, are unlikely that we would be able to do, because I'm sure there are, uh, yeah, let's, you know, let's take a look at them and, and let's put it on the roadmap and, and enable it. Then what's the, what's the next step? Do you plan to replicate the features in CFS or actually focus on implementing new features that the CFS can't do right now? So, okay, so this is our plan for now, on, on our side at least. So we're rolling this out internally. Um, so we're gonna be using this in prod and, and that's, you know, because of the savings that we're getting, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a priority for us at the moment. Um, in, in parallel to that, I'm adding, so the shared weight queue patches that I keep pointing at or keep alluding to, that was entirely done in, in, uh, in Sketty XT first. And that's, we experimented with a lot of different approaches to load balancing between shared weight queues and stuff like that. I'm trying to upstream that right now. And then kind of more broadly, it's me and Tajan that are working on this with help from, from folks like Dave and Alexi and the, the BPF community. But um, we're trying to get other people in the industry to, to, to test, to like experiment with it um, you know, we're getting a lot of pushback from people um, who who really, you know, they're, they're afraid of it or, or like they don't, maybe they're not like the biggest fans of BPF. And so the, the way that we think that we can get this in, um, if people do think it's useful, is to just rally the, like the, the, the kernel community around it, right? So again, you know, Valve is interested, ARM, AMD, people have said that they're going to start experimenting and getting, getting interest like that is kind of sort of our main focus at the moment, you know? I ask that question is because I think it's an important because uh, it determines what the position of a uh, Sketty XT is. Do you think of it as a maybe a takeover of the CFS no, or just no. a complement of uh, something the CFS cannot do? I think I kind of prefer the, the, the latter because I think there are many useful features that didn't get upstreamed or merged into CFS, but they are really useful, such as a uh, soft affinity that you mentioned. Yeah. I noticed that. There was a patch that uh, was a proposed upstream several years ago, but eventually didn't get in. But it's super useful for this uh, AMD CCX uh, architecture. Yeah. So I think if I were you to doing this, driving the effort in Sketch ESD, I would do something that was uh, uh, develop features that the CFS uh, cannot do right now, because that's something useful and uh, help people to, to kind of uh, complement on the CFS side. Absolutely, I completely agree, agree with you, and um, we're doing that, right? So, so that's shared wake queue is, is our first upstream attempt at that. Um, and we, I mean, look, it's extremely difficult to to try to upstream things into CFS. It's very complex. The bar for getting things in is quite high, and so what we want to do is provide an environment where, yeah, you can try things out and even maybe merge something and see how it works and see how industry uses it and change it or throw it away if it doesn't work that well. Um, but the intention is to to go places that CFS could go, but it's just really hard, right? Like, so that's shared weight queue. The soft affinity is one that we're that we're going to roll out. Um, CPU. Yeah, CPU control, absolutely. Um, and we actually, and so CPU control. It's funny. We tried to implement that. Um, it took us. We somebody on our team tried to upstream that for 18 months into CFS, and somebody came in and knacked it because there's a corner case where if you have a whole bunch of low priority C groups that are waking up at the same time, you have a thundering herd problem and they get too much CPU. Okay, so we can't go into CFS, but it was 18 months of effort, right? And Tajan wrote the flat CG scheduler, which is useful for us. I mean, it's Tajan, so he's like he's like a very very good engineer, but it took him like a week, right? So that's a delta of like I don't know 80 weeks, something like that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we're we trying, and um, it's just a, scale, a question of scaling at this point. And so, and so there's soft affinity, which we're working on, and then um, uh, something that, that came up a lot at OSPM is soft real-time, where you have tasks that have low latency requirements, and the user experience is much better if they can run quickly. VR, you know, mobile for, for rendering threads, whatever. Um, but if they don't run, it's fine. Nobody's going to die. The plane's not going to crash. 
And so for those kinds of requirements where like it's hard real time, you can't use SCADIXE, you can't use CFS, you have to use Deadline or like RT or something like that. Um, but uh, but we want to be able to you know implement like yeah like soft real time as well, which I think is very very pervasive. Like Chrome could definitely use it. Um, there was a proposal at OSPM. I, I wish that Joel were here. He has some way more context than me, so I don't want to speak for him. But there was a proposal to like potentially have to make Chrome use SCADRT, which would mean it has to be root, which obviously is not quite tenable for upstreaming either. So yeah, I mean there's there's a lot of things that CFS can't do yet, um, and it's you know it, it just we believe in upstreaming, like we think everybody should benefit and we want to upstream it to CFS. And for us, this feels like the, the easiest way to do it, you know. Yeah. All right, I think we're closing out here. Okay. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you very much, really exciting work. Thank you, yep.